So the testimony gives you the experience without having to pay the cost for the experience. So there are some people here who experience many things that, that you all, that our graduates are about to embark on life. But it's up to you to listen and take heed and make the right decision for yourself. Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The word before we get started, Pastor Tiffany, when you come, go straight into your song. We're ready to go. How many feel like I'm, I'm going in whether I'm ready or not? Because it's not about how I feel, not about what I think or what I believe, except that I believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The word today is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 7, and it says, you guys can go ahead and start your music. And, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I, lest I should be exalted above measure. He says, before this thing I sought the Lord thrice, that he, it might depart from me. But God said, he said unto me, but my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So I said, most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ that may rest upon me. So listen. So he said, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities. I take pleasure in persecutions. I take pleasure in being wrong, treated wrong. I take pleasure in being cussed out. I take pleasure in being slapped around. I take pleasure in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So I came to let somebody know this morning, you are strong in the Lord. Put your mind, lay those things, lay your cares and your concerns aside. It's time to worship the Lord. Come on and let's give God praise. Hey, 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 hey. 
awesome God. He's an awesome God. He's a loving God. He's a great God. And we give him glory. We give him glory. Hallelujah. We bless his name. There's nobody like him. You're awesome. 
did you give him your best? Come on, put your hands together if you know you gave God your best. Hallelujah. How many know that Jesus is your strength? Jesus is my strength on today. I remember growing up anytime, anytime things got hard, I could just hear Daddy singing that song. You know, and it seems like we often forget who our real strength is. And I want everybody to know, whatever you're going through, Jesus is your real strength. Hallelujah, if you can remain standing, the scripture will be coming from Philippians 4, 11 through 13. If you could grab your Bibles and have, say amen when you have it. If not, you can follow it on the screen. I promise you I won't be before you long, maybe 25, 30 minutes or so. Lord's will. Amen. Hallelujah. Philippians 4, 10 through 13. Verse 10 says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me have flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am that with to be content. Verse 12 says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, not to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, everybody's favorite scripture, we can all say it together, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You all may be seated. Today's title, if I could have a topic for today, it would be Spot Me. Spot Me. Probably like, what does that mean, Spot Me? If, if anybody in here, anybody got any weight lifters other than Stephen, I know Stephen's been lifting weights. Whenever you have a spot, Sister Tanaya, whenever you have a spot, that is the person <laughs> that helps guide you lift some weight, Amen. So, you know, every now and again, I, I like to go to the gym. I'm more, I'm more of a cardio kind of guy. You know, I, I like to walk for about 30 minutes or so, and then maybe I, I'll hit the weights. But, but what's so interesting to me, I, I love going to this park because, because I always see different people that, that try to motivate themselves at the gym, amen? Amen. You got some people where when they're trying to lift the weights, they, they grunt real hard, past the Matisse, they, right? They're just, they, they trying to get their weight up. They're trying to motivate themselves. They're trying to psych themselves out, amen? And then you have some people who, who just have their headphones in and, and they're just zoning out. You don't know what they're listening to. Hopefully it's some Jesus music by Lecrae or, or some Kent Spirituals, uh, Brother Uncle Henry, maybe something like that. Uh, but the most interesting people to me, the most interesting weightlifters to me are the ones who, who come in packs together. The ones who, who try to motivate each other. You know, it may be three, it may be four of them. And it's always interesting to me because I like to go to the gym by myself because that way I can go in and I can come out. But most of the time I see those people, it's like I go in the gym, I come back the next day, and they're still in there together working on the same workout that they had before because they have to rotate wherever they're at. So this is the most interesting thing to me because none of them have the same strength. None of them have the same strength. There may be someone that's real strong like you, Brother Stephen, and then there may be another one like me who, who doesn't like to lift weights who may be kind of weak. So they're taking turns pulling the weights off of the bench, but then they have to put more weight back on the bench for everybody to be able to collaboratively work together. You know, but they figure something out that they're better together. They figure out that there's strength in numbers. They realize that if one person is weak, eventually he can become strong like us. I believe in Matthew chapter 18, verses 9 through 20, Jesus said, Again, I say unto you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. There is always something when people come together. There's some strength when people come together. But one other interesting, one other interesting thing I often notice about people who quote this verse is they assume it's like some magical superpower. 
I, I, I don't know. I think I, it was one of our youth. They were saying, Brother Rod, Pastor Rod, I, I want to get this tatted on me. I'm going to get Philippians 4 and 13 tatted on me. And I told him, I was like, why? And he's like, because, you know, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But I want to give you some context today. I want to give you some context on what Paul was really talking about when he says this scripture. So Paul is actually giving thanks to the church of Philippians for the gifts and the support that they were giving him while he was suffering. Amen. So verse 11 says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content. I want you to remember that word, content with whatever I have. Verse 12 says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty stomach, with little or with plenty. So in these scriptures, Paul tells us that he had to gain victory over his anxiety. Amen. So there's certain things that our young people that we go through on a regular basis. It seems like the world is against us. It's, it's these heavy weights of things. That's called anxiety. Amen. And see, Paul has figured out, he says he's going to be no longer a slave to the things of this world. In 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives us pretty much what I like to call a stat line of his suffering. Let me, so before you all want to, you know, just put this tattoo on you, you want to just go out and quote this verse as much as you can. Let, let me give you some context of what Paul went through. If you want to see it yourself, it's in 2 Corinthians verse 11. It said that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He, he was a true descendant of Abraham. In other words, he, he had the right to serve Christ. He, he was a true Christian among Christians if anyone had been a Christian. He had been in prison and he had been whipped more than he can account, more than he could count. You know, so we often talk about Jesus and, and the 39 lashes. He, he said he received 39 lashes five times. There's significance in that number 39 with the Roman soldiers. What a lot of people don't know is, as Pastor Matisha has informed us several times, is those 39 lashes, the Roman soldiers had figured out the right amount of pain for someone to receive right before they die. So Paul is proclaiming the, the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere that he goes. And he received 39 lashes five times. He said, he says, I've been beaten with rods. He said he has been stoned. He's, he's been shipwrecked. He's, he's traveled far and wide. He, he's been robbed. He, he's lost his favor with his family. He's lost his favor with his friends. He's, he, he has all his enemies. He even faced danger with people who claim to love Christ, so-called Christians, the people that he gave the gospel to even have a problem with him. He had gone without food. He went hungry. He also went without clothes. So, so when Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, these are the things that he had to go through. See, Paul went through this thing that we call experience. Psalms 37 and 25 says, once I was young, and now I am old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or his children begging for bread. See, Paul understood that the experiences of life gave him everything that he needed in comfort. He didn't look for comfort in the things of the world, but he received comfort from the comforter. Amen. Second Corinthians 1 and 4 says he comforts us in all trouble so that we can comfort others when they are in trouble. We will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. See, Paul understood that this discomfort wasn't a misfortune, but it was a testimony to comfort future believers in Christ. Amen. So Paul knew that all that he had been through was not just a loss, but it was a lesson. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. I, we may have it on the screen. We may not. It says, if I ever take a loss, it's a lesson for the future believer's blessing. If I ever take a loss, it's really a lesson for a future believer's blessing. So lessons are learned in what I like to call the school of 
affliction. Amen. We're still talking context right now. I'll get to you in a second. So one of the biggest lessons that I ever learned was behind the things that I did in life. So I remember I was about 14 or 15. I, I took driver's ed. I got my license when, when I was 16. I, I learned everything that I could in school, Pastor Matician. I learned it. And every time I drove, my mom and my dad would tell me one thing. Stop following behind the car so close. Stop doing it. And I was okay. And I hit the brakes. I back off a little bit. But eventually I get right behind them, right? Stop riding behind the car so close. Well, I thought I was listening. I, I really did. I, I really thought I was listening to him, and I wish I would have listened more. So I remember in 2017, leaving the school of David, I was on I-40. It was raining, and I was behind a car real close. I had just bought a 2011 550, S550 Mercedes Benz. I, I just started making money really good, and I got behind a car too close. Bam. Bam! Totaled my first car. I said, man, Lord, I, I thank you for bringing me out. I, I shouted because I, I came out without a scratch. I was a little sore. 2018, I was in a work van behind somebody too close. Bam! Hit them again. 2019, I had my, I had my, my dad's work truck in GMC following too close. Matter of fact, I went by on the road. This time, you know, my daddy ain't offering grace this time. If y'all know Brother Anza, he, Mr. Anza, he don't play. First time, I said, it's okay, son, I love you. So, this time, look, man, you got to stop wrecking my truck. <laughs> I ain't going to put you in no more car. But he did. He did. Said, so after all of this, I thought I learned a lesson and that it was over. I, I said, I, I still hadn't hit any other car since. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. But even in this moment, I'm still suffering from it. I don't know if y'all ever see the Allstate commercials. Y'all may watch it, and it's okay. This is mayhem. Blah, blah, blah. And then a man running to the back. I have PTSD every time I see it. It bothers me. It really does. It's funny, but it, it really bothers me. Because every time I see it, I'm like, man, it, it just reminds me of every single time that I hit someone in the back. And I, not only just the PTSD, but our insurance rates. My insurance is through the roof right now. And I'm a roofer. We tried to apply for some insurance together. Ash was like, no, nah, I think you better go on your own. You're going to have to take care of that yourself. I ain't had no accident. She's a safe driver, amen. That's why when y'all see us riding together, why is she always driving? Well, you know. But we have to learn the lessons. Psalms 119, 71 to 72 says, my suffering was good for me. For it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. Your instructions are more valuable to me than millions of gold and silver. This is why I listen wholeheartedly to everyone's testimony to this day. There's so much power in listening to people's testimony, Brother Stephen. Because, see, what happens is we're able to live through their experience, what they went through, so you can make a proper decision on what you want to do. So when Paul is giving us his testimony over and over and over again, the reason why he says it is like, look, you don't necessarily have to go through the things that I went through, but you can go through it through me because I've already suffered it for you. See, a testimony, write this down, a testimony gives you experience without having to pay the cost of the experience. So a testimony gives you the experience without having to pay the cost for the experience. So there are some people here who experience many things that, that you all, that our graduates are about to embark on life, but it's up to you to listen and take heed and make the right decision for yourself. See, all of these things come back to Philippians 4 and 11 and the, in, in its true context, context, which is the word content. I believe this is the last note that I want to give you all is contentment contentment. So Paul wasn't talking about some magical superpower from, from our Father God because that's not where the power comes from. The power came in Acts, amen? But this was, Paul was talking about was his contentment with life. Contentment means a state of happiness and satisfaction. No matter what you go through, a state of happiness and satisfaction. So one, Paul was content. He was, he was, he was content with himself, but he wasn't stagnant. 
You have to remember, there's a difference between being content and there's a difference between being stagnant. So being content, you're going to keep on moving. You're going to keep on growing. You're going to keep on going through trials, tribulations, and different situations. But see, when you're stagnant, that's when you're still. That's when you're moving in, in fear. I, I like to say you become a bookshelf. You know, you, you're full of knowledge. You're, you're full of all these educational things, but you haven't moved away from what God is trying to take you away from. See, Paul makes it clear that he kept preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ going through everything that he went through. He went through the 39 lashes. He, he had been stoned. He, he, he had been cursed by his family. He had been pushed away, but he wasn't stagnant. He said, I'm content, but I'm not stagnant. 1 Timothy 6 and 6 says, true godliness with contentment is itself a great wealth. See, Paul also understood he had to be optimistic as well. He knew, he said, look, it, it would be better to die. I'm telling you, it would be much better to die because I, I would be with my father in heaven. Yeah. But there's more work for me to do in this life. So I want to give you all some points. I want to tell you, I want you to be content in the valley. Be content in the valley. Numbers 24 and 6 says, like valleys, they spread out, like gardens beside rivers, like alloys planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Psalms 1, verses 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sits in the company of mockers. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night? That person. Say that person. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which, his, which yields its fruit in its season and whose leaf shall not wither. Whatsoever they do, it shall prosper. So I want to give you two things before we leave. I want you to be planted like cedar trees. Be planted like cedar trees, young people. See, a cedar tree is a, it's a big, wide tree. And, and what it does is it, it goes thousands of feet in the ground looking for nutrients, looking for water to keep itself to grow. See, but a cedar tree that is planted by the river has all the nutrients that it needs. Amen. So I want you to remember that river is your word. So students, when you're going off to college, students, as, as you are in school and all the things that are going on in our school system right now, you have to remember, I'm going to learn something in school, but let me go back to my river. Let me go back to my river. What does the word of God say about the things that my friends are doing? What does the word of God say about that pastor that I saw on Instagram? What does the word of God say about this current Facebook post that I see? Be planted like a cedar tree. Next, I want, to, want you all to fly like eagles out of the valley. Be content in your valley, amen, but you have to be able to fly like eagles. See, there's something about an eagle that many people probably don't know, but they live for so long, but they have to go through this process. They have to go through this process, Pastor Matisha, called rebirth. So when an uh, uh, eagle, they can live up to 70 years. They, they say that's the average lifespan of an eagle. They, they start out in the nest, and then they're released after the age of two. See, they can do everything they can. They learn everything in the valley. They learn how to hunt. They learn how to fly. They, they even make friends. They fellowship with other birds, amen. They, they hunt over and over again. But after some time, everything that they learn and gain begins to spoil. And they must make a tough decision. They must make a tough decision to either die to themselves or go through the rebirth process. Well, that rebirth process is a little different than what most people may think. And, you know, the rebirth process means they have to fly all the way to the top of a mountain. They have to take their beaks. They have to crush it against the mountain. They, they literally break their beaks off, and it, and it bleeds. It, it, it's very painful. After they do this, they have to pluck every single feather that they have from their bodies. Once they do that, they break off the claws 
that they have. They, and and they are, they're, bleeding, they're bleeding profusely at this moment. But once they get this done, it's much displeasure, much pain that they have to go through, much suffering that they have to go through. Once they get this done, they go back to the valley. Amen. And they learn how to fly again. They learn how to hunt again. They, they make new friends again. They, they learn how to fly even higher. They learn how to hunt even better. They can actually, I think it said that they can see from like 600 yards. They go from 600 to 800 yards. And they double their lifespan because they decide to go through this rebirth process. So you're going to fly higher when you go through the rebirth process. You're going to be able to hunt even better when you go through the rebirth process. You're going to have even better friends. When you go through the rebirth process. See, Paul, he understood. Paul understood. He understood this rebirth process. He, he was a Hebrew on Hebrews, right? He was, a, he was an Israelite among Israelites, amen? He, he, he was the one that was going actually out, out actually killing Christians. But he said, look, there's something that has to change within me. Some people say he got knocked off his hours. We know that he just fell and, and God blinded his eyes. He covered his eyes. But he had to go down to the valley. He had to lose his old friends. He, he had to go to the top of the mountaintop and completely destroy himself. And then he could finally come back and say, for I know I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Jesus. Jesus is your strength. See, when you're lifting weights properly, you, you, you've got to have a spot. You've got to have someone that may be a little bit stronger than you. You have to have someone that's already experienced what you are about to lift, amen? You have to have someone that knows, okay, I know how to spot them the right way where they can get stronger, but at the same time, I'm not doing too much of the work for them. Well, I got something to tell you. You have a spot. And his spot is the name Jesus. Amen. Yeah. In Matthew 11, Matthew 11, I think Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, right now, some of you, some of you are lifting weights that, that you weren't designed to lift. You, you're trying to lift up depression. You're trying to lift up some type of identity confusion. You're lifting up division. You're lifting up some kind of hate. You're lifting up all of these things that the enemy is trying to place on your life. But in Galatians 2 and 20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not, but I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Last scripture says, Romans 12 and 2, it says, and be not comforted to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And be not conformed to this world, for we know that the world gives you this weight. See, the weight that you've been carrying your whole life, Christ has already lifted it. He's already carried it. He carried it on a cross for you. So whatever it is that, that you're trying to carry, whatever it seems like that people placed on you in your life, whatever it is, you all you have to do is drop it and give it to Christ. He's already lifted it. He's your spot. Amen. But there's another process that you have to go through as an individual. You have to get down. You, you have to get down on the bench as I close. You have to lift these weights, but Christ is going to give you a different weight. He's going to give you a weight of love. He gives you a weight of joy. He gives you a weight of peace. He gives you a weight of patience. He gives you a weight of kindness. He gives you a weight of generosity. He gives you a weight of faithfulness. He gives you a weight of gentleness and self-control. Those are the real weights to help you survive in this life. You can't survive on the weights of the world, but the weights of the fruit of the Spirit. As you plant yourself in your word day in and day out, God is going to loom those fruits.